the Scranton Strangler has got nothing on these 15 most dangerous inmates in the world. John Wayne Gacy This fella was a jovial man who loved to spread cheer by performing as Pogo the Clown, or Patches the Clown. He got a new nickname, the Killer Clown, when news of his heinous misdeeds came to light. Gacy was a serial killer responsible for taking out at least 33 men and boys. As a child, he endured the attentions of an often abusive father and had been sexually molested. He was sickly too and failed to graduate from high school. But that did not stop him from getting a college degree, marrying, and successfully running a business. In 1968, he was arrested for performing an intimate act on a teen and was given a 10-year sentence, with divorce papers served on sentencing day. Gacy was released after serving 18 months and he remarried and divorced shortly after. He began killing in 1972 and would usually ply his victims with drugs and alcohol before pouncing. It was his last murder that did him in, with the investigation and attention that followed eventually triggering a voluntary confession from the killer clown that resulted in his trial and execution on May 9, 1994 by lethal injection. Jeffrey Dahmer A cannibal, sex offender, murderer, and serial killer was Jeffrey Dahmer, and he was born on May 21, 1960, the first of two sons. Most sources agree on his having a normal childhood, but the young Dahmer was lonely, friendless, and withdrawn. As a child, he was fascinated with dead animals and their bones, played with these as much as he could, and learned body bone preservation skills from his dad. His parents divorced while he was in high school, and that led the young Dahmer to increasingly seek comfort in alcohol. He committed his first murder in his late teens, with the victim being a hitchhiker he'd met by chance. Dahmer then sought to make something of his life by enrolling in Ohio State University, but his persistent alcohol abuse hindered progress. He enrolled in the Marine Corps, but the alcohol abuse continued and he was deemed unfit for service and honorably discharged. Dahmer fully kicked off his slaying spree while in his late 20s, with his victims being men and boys that he would drug with sleeping pills. The lid was blown off everything in July of 1991 when a would-be victim escaped and called the cops, and they ran into his collection of human body parts. Interviewed by the cops, Dahmer freely confessed about taking out 16 people, along with cannibalism and necrophilia. He was eventually given 16 life sentences. On November 28, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was bludgeoned to death by an inmate. Lobster Boy There are some odd folks on this top 15 most dangerous prison inmates list, but Lobster Boy got them all beat. He was born with a congenital defect that resulted in his hands and feet fusing like lobster claws. Lobster Boy's real name was Grady Franklin Stiles Jr. He married twice and had four kids. He made a good living through touring the country with his family as carnival freaks, but was a violent and abusive alcoholic. In 1978, he shot and killed his daughter's fiancé on their wedding eve, and the motive was that he did not approve of the would-be groom marrying his favorite child. At the trial, an openly remorseless Grady Franklin Stiles Jr. confessed to the crime, but due to his crippling disability and ill health, he was found guilty on third-degree murder charges and sentenced to house arrest and 15 years of probation. His drinking and abuse worsened, and eventually his first wife and her son paid someone to fill him with lead, and the deed was done. Lobster Boy was an abrasive, bad-tempered, and much-disliked man. Because of this, there were only 10 people at his funeral, and none volunteered as pallbearer. Eileen Warnos Eileen Warnos is one of the most famous and divisive serial killers, and while working as a lady of the night, shot, killed, and robbed seven men, supposedly in self-defense. But juries didn't buy the self-defense story, and she was found guilty of all but one murder, with her execution being carried out on October 9, 2002. Eileen, like most other serial killers on this list, had a very terrible childhood. From age 11, she began performing questionable favors in return for cash and candy, frequently engaging in intimate acts with her brother and for years had been abused by her grandfather with a friend of his assaulting and getting her pregnant at age 14. She gave the child up for adoption, quit school, and became a full-time sex worker at age 15. Eileen briefly married, with the marriage being marked by violence and annulled after nine weeks. She committed her first murder in November of 1989 and the last in November of 1990. Her lover and partner in crime helped the police nail her by eliciting a confession. She was sentenced to death for six of the murders and her story has inspired movies, poems, and documentaries. Nico Jenkins Nico Jenkins was born in September of 1996 and came from a particularly crime-prone family. At seven years old, he was detained for taking a gun to school, and at 15 years old, he was arrested for carjacking and aggravated assault, eventually snagging a 21-year sentence and serving 10 and a half years. Around two weeks after his prison release, Nico, with the assistance of some family members, took out four people. On September 3, 2013, he confessed to all four acts, saying it had been done as a sacrifice in honor of an ancient Egyptian god of chaos that few had heard of, named Apap, or Apophis. 
Nico elected to represent himself during his trial, and his courtroom antics took the form of laughter, speaking in tongues, and howling with glee as his crimes were recounted. That must not have been entertaining enough for the court because he was found guilty of all four murder charges. In May of 2017, he was sentenced to death and given an extra 450 years on weapons charges. Thomas Silverstein Thomas Silverstein spent 36 years in solitary confinement and 42 years in jail and was reportedly the most isolated prisoner in American history. The California-born Silverstein was a shy child and bullies picked on him like candy. His mom encouraged him to fight back and this in turn encouraged violent tendencies in the young lad. At age 14, he was sent to a youth home for stealing a car and fighting a cop, and at 19 years, he got jailed for armed robbery. Paroled after four years, he was soon back in the slammer, serving a 15-year sentence for another armed robbery. While serving this sentence, he was convicted of murdering another inmate and given a life sentence that was overturned on appeal. Then, he was convicted of killing another inmate, receiving a life sentence for real this time, and was soon given another life sentence for the murder of a prison gang boss. Silverstein then committed the unforgivable sin of taking out a prison officer and was placed into the strictest possible solitary confinement. He died in May of 2019 of heart surgery complications and has been described as a good man with a short fuse. Dennis Rader This is the BTK killer, and the initials stand for Bind, Torture, and Kill. He is responsible for 10 murders in Kansas and is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences. Dennis Rader was born in March of 1945 and from an early age reportedly had persistent fantasies of torturing helpless women. He also loved torturing and killing small critters and had a thing for wearing women's clothes and undies and performing intimate acts while dressed in these or with a rope around his neck. Rader committed his first murders in January of 1974, killing four family members for no apparent reason. This was followed by the murder of three women, and he killed his final victim in February of 1991. Investigations weren't going anywhere, till Raider inadvertently helped out. He had a compulsive need for attention and had frequently sent taunting letters to the police and news media, and it was this correspondence that eventually led to his arrest. From the evidence gathered on a floppy disk, investigators were able to categorize Raider as a major person of interest, and this plus a positive sample from a DNA test got him arrested. Raider pled guilty and made a full confession. Andre Chikatilo Andre Chikatilo's nicknames include the Rostov Ripper, the Red Ripper, and the Butcher of Rostov. The future mass murderer was born in October of 1936 in the Ukrainian SSR, with medical issues that caused urinary incontinence and impotence. Andre started his criminal career in 1973. In that year, he forced himself on one of his pupils, and a few months later, he assaulted another student. He first combined sexual assault with murder starting in 1978, preying on children, teens, and adults of both sexes. During the massive investigations that followed his grisly killings, he was seen acting suspiciously and arrested. Since there was no direct evidence against him, he was pressured to confess and tearfully did so in extremely graphic detail. He confessed to a total of 56 murders, knowing details only the murderer could have known and leading police to where some of his victims were buried. Deemed mentally fit to stand trial, he was found guilty of 52 murders and in February of 1994 was taken out and unceremoniously shot. Rodney Alcala the dating game killer was born in Texas to a Mexican-American couple. Age 17, he joined the U.S. Army, only to get medically discharged after suffering a nervous breakdown. His first known crime was the sexual and physical assault of a child. The parents of the victim forbade her from testifying, so Alcala only got a three-year sentence. He served 17 months before being paroled and was sent back shortly after for assaulting a teen. His 1978 appearance and win in a game show got Alcala his enduring nickname. In July of 1979, he was arrested for the murder of a 12-year-old ballet dancer and sentenced to death. This was overturned due to a technicality, and following a retrial, he was resentenced to death, with this conviction being overturned on appeal. While still being held, DNA analysis helped prove his involvement in multiple murders. In February of 2010, he got the chance to defend himself in court on five murder charges. Alcala did not offer much of a defense and was found guilty of all five killings. He died on death row last year of natural causes at age 77. Underwear Strangler Johann Jack Unterweger was born in Austria, had something of a rough childhood, and spent most of his youth in jail on a variety of offenses. In 1974, he strangled an 18-year-old German girl and was handed a life sentence. But while in prison, Unterweger took to writing and got extremely good at it, winning rave reviews on multiple continents. His blossoming literary genius was taken as evidence that he was now reformed and an ultimately successful campaign was began for his release and pardon. A free man, Unterweger, seemed poised to keep soaring and perhaps win a Nobel Prize in literature. 
But then it was discovered that just after being pardoned and released, he had murdered a woman in Czechoslovakia and seven other women in Austria with their bra straps. At the time, though, there was insufficient evidence to arrest him. When all the evidence was in place, Unterweger opted to make a run for it and was eventually cornered and arrested in Florida in February of 1992. He was taken to Austria and in June of 1994 found guilty on nine murders and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. But Unterweger took his life before this verdict was able to take effect. Charlie Bronson Known far and wide as Britain's most notorious prisoner, Charlie Bronson, or Charles Salvador, as he now calls himself, is notable for his handlebar mustache and extreme proclivity for violence. He was born in December of 1952 and first went to jail in 1975 on armed robbery charges. His original sentence was seven years, but that kept being extended due to his tendency to violently attack prisoners and prison guards. He was eventually released in 1987, but was thrown back into the slammer the next year for robbing a jewelry shop. Bronson was released in 92, rearrested in 93 for conspiracy to rob, and sentenced to eight years. During this stint, his violent tendencies continued, and he, at different times, took guards, a doctor, and other prisoners hostage and violently attacked many, including a prison governor. Due to many unsavory incidents, his original sentence was changed to life imprisonment. Charlie Bronson has penned many books on his prison experience and has been the subject of many studies. He has been interviewed by the press more times than can be counted, and the biopic based on his life experiences was released in 2008. Eyeball Man Well-built, tall, mean-looking, heavily tattooed, and sporting a tattooed eyeball that's near as black as coal. Jason Barnum, or the Eyeball Man as he is most commonly known, is not the typical inmate. He's currently a guest of the government after pleading guilty to first-degree attempted murder, first-degree burglary, and third-degree felony weapon possession charges, and there's a 22-year sentence he has to complete before the government will open the prison doors and tell him to go and sin no more. At his trial, a sober Jason tried to blame the Justice Department for letting him out of jail in 2010 without job prospects, excused his burglaries as being motivated by his need to fund his drug habit, and his beautiful face has made it impossible for him to get legitimate employment, but the court wasn't that sympathetic. Jason Barnum is not the law-abiding kind and had 14 prior convictions. He might not be all that dangerous, but there is no doubt about his ability to scare folks better than most. Robert Maudsley the English press dubbed this guy Hannibal the Cannibal, after apparently spurious reports emerged that he had dined on the brain matter of one of his victims. He is currently the longest-serving prisoner in Britain. Born Robert John Maudsley in June of 1953, his early years were spent in an orphanage and was subjected to extreme abuse as a child, and his teens performed sex work and used this to fund his drug habit. In 1974, Robert Garrett, a would-be client who had reportedly abused children and then turned himself over to the police, but rather than try him for the crime, they sent him to a mental hospital. While there, he and another inmate leisurely tortured and took out a convicted child molester. Robert was then convicted on a manslaughter charge and sent to Wakefield Prison. He then killed two prisoners in a single day. After that incident, a special cell with special furnishings was designed for him, and there he stays all day, but is allowed an hour off for exercise, but only with a phalanx of six guards. Prison has not reformed the now 68-year-old Robert Maudsley, and in a recent interview, his nephew revealed he would gladly kill again. Typhoid Mary Mary Mallon, or Typhoid Mary, as she was known for much of her natural life, had an almost compulsive need to cook for the high and mighty. She might have never made it into the history books, save for two related facts. She never washed her hands after emptying her bowels, and she was a healthy carrier of typhoid fever. Typhoid Mary was born in 1869 in Ireland, and at age 15, she went to the U.S. to make something of herself. Between 1900 and 1907, she cooked for eight families, and there was a typhoid outbreak in all but one. Eventually, an investigator determined she was the cause, and the New York City Health Department forcefully quarantined her. She was released from quarantine in 1910 upon promising that she would never again seek employment as a cook. She kept this promise for a while before returning to her old job, with typhoid outbreaks following her around like a bad cloud. Typhoid Mary was eventually traced, arrested, and put back in quarantine. She died alone and friendless at age 69 of pneumonia complications. Her ignorance led to the sickness of multitudes and the death of from 5 to 50 people. Souflacar Things could be wild in the Ottoman Empire. It was characterized by brutality on an often great scale, and the zero value attached to lives is illustrated by the fact that the Ottoman emperors routinely hired gardeners whose side jobs consisted of racing against and violently disposing of people the emperor no longer liked. One of these murderous gardeners went by the name of Suflakar. He served as the head gardener and executioner of Mehmed IV, and his job consisted of keeping the palace gardens immaculate and entering races with people facing execution. Those who won the race across the palace gardens were banished, with losers being strangled to death. 
Considering that this fellow killed around 5,000 people in less than five years with his bare hands as the Emperor's orders and had a very intimate knowledge of the palace gardens, we don't think many were able to outrun him and escape their fate. 